saints facing critical challenges in the life of the church. Eastertide Talks of 2017, organised by Luke Gormelli at Guardian Angels Parish, East London. Dickon Friar of the English province. He is director of the Las Casas Institute at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford University. The Institute is concerned with social justice issues in the light of Catholic teaching. Prior to his present position, he was novice master of the English Dominican province. That followed a long period during which he was regent at Blackfriars Hall and of the Dominican House of Studies in Oxford. He continues to be a member of the theology faculty and of the classics faculty of the university where he is where his teaching is on the fathers of the church and in particular Saint Augustine, that's the topic of tonight's talk, and on church history. In 2006, he published a book on almsgiving in the later Roman Empire and in 2009, a book on asceticism in the Greco-Roman world. At present, in preparation for the 800th anniversary in 2021 of the founding of the English Dominican province in 1221, he is researching the history of the province from its origin to the present day. So um, I welcome you, Father Richard, and we look forward to hearing your talk. And to begin our evening, let's say the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Our Holy Father St. Dominic, pray for us. So thank you for the invitation to come and speak here this evening. An opening question. What does it take to be good? How do we become good people? As individuals and as a community. That's not an idle question. Far from it. It impacts on how you raise your children. On how society is organized on how we think about God and religion. What does it take to be good? Across the millennia, philosophers, scientists, and theologians have pitched into the debate. Plato once offered the Athenians what, at first glance, looked to be a very simple answer. All we need for virtue, for moral excellence, is knowledge, a correct understanding of the good to be chosen. The difficulty, as he often presented it, lay primarily in ascertaining the good to be chosen, gaining the relevant knowledge. How do we gain wisdom in the first place? His so-called aporetic dialogues, dialogues that end in aporia, often pull the rug from under those who are too confident of their judgments. Conventional wisdom turning out to be little more than popular opinion. Plato's search for something better led him to imagine a very different social order, a radical politics that might allow a philosopher king to disseminate wisdom to the young. Well, so that's one take. Centuries later, Karl Marx looked to the sufferings of workers during the Industrial Revolution, whose labor enriched a growing bourgeoisie 
he envisaged a very different but equally radical distribution of goods, a new equality of opportunity to be achieved through revolution and social engineering. What about our own lifetime? Well, there have been scientists and philosophers whose study of the natural world, whose reflection on the laws of nature or psychology, have led them to a deterministic view of human nature. They say, oh well, we're products of our genes, or products of our early childhood. According to this reductionist philosophy, you may think you're free to choose what we take to be good, but really, that's an illusion. As Jim Watson put it, there are only molecules. Everything else is sociology. Others again have argued there's no objective good for human beings. There are good ways to cook a pizza. You can design a good lawnmower. But there's no objective definition of a good life. Some version of this moral relativism is often espoused in our own liberal society. Though somewhat oddly, it's widely accompanied by intolerance of people who don't sign up to the prevailing liberal values. Now, what might a Christian theologian have to say about all this? Well, St. Augustine, the 5th century Bishop of Hippo, has a lot to say about this. And I suggest to you it's time that we gave his arguments a fresh look. Against radical skeptics, St. Augustine insisted that we have knowledge of objective truths. Against Manichees, that's followers of a much earlier religious teacher, Mani. St. Augustine defended our exercise of free will. And, as I hope to show this evening, St. Augustine attacked the teachings of the British thinker, the British ascetic Pelagius, to insist that knowledge of the good and freedom of choice are not enough if we wish to become good people. We cannot, or rather we will not, choose the good and grow in goodness without God's help. God's grace, working within us a profound change of heart. Probably helpful to sketch first an outline of St. Augustine's life, especially his early life. Born in 354 in what's now Algeria, he was raised as a Catholic by his mother, but not baptized in childhood. That's going to be important later. In those days, infant baptism was customary in many parts of the church, but it wasn't universal practice. His parents, who just about belonged, they kind of scraped into the local aristocracy, the local government, if you like, they were ambitious for him and sent him as a youth to get the very best education in Carthage. And he excelled as a student of oratory with the necessary command of literature and philosophy required for public speaking. And eventually he rose to become the appointed professor of rhetoric at the imperial capital of Milan in 384. But in the course of all this education and climbing up the greasy pole, he abandoned his Catholic faith. He became a manichae, convinced that matter was the only reality. And as he later saw it, he became enslaved to his own passions or lusts. Not just sexual lust, also lust for power lust for glory. 
ambition. But these were certainly the years in which he found a sexual partner, whom he loved but never married, and with whom he fathered a son. At Milan, however, he met the Catholic bishop, Ambrose. St. Ambrose and his circle opened up for Augustine an allegorical way of reading the Bible, seeing deeper meanings and patterns beneath the literal surface. He met Christian Platonists who freed him from a materialist view of the world. They helped him to debunk the complex myths of the Manichees and to see that evil itself is the absence of some good, not some substance in its own right. Well, in 387, Augustine formally re-embraced the Catholic faith of his childhood and was baptised by Ambrose. He abandoned his career and any thoughts of marriage. On his return to North Africa, he adopted a celibate, ascetic way of life, forming a small religious community with close friends, until in 391 he was hijacked he was forcibly ordained to the priesthood in the coastal port city of Hippo. Now he had rapidly to gain a deeper understanding of the Bible in order to preach. He became the town's Catholic bishop around about 396, and from then until his eventual death in 430, was a tireless pastor and preacher he was the leading Catholic theologian, the leading polemicist in the African church, writing numerous works to explain and defend the Catholic faith. He opined of the Roman author Varro that he read so much, it amazes us that he had time to write anything, wrote so much that we scarce believe a man might read as much. Well, you could say the same of Augustine himself. The works we have left, the works we still have, yeah, include over 500 sermons, over 100 treatises, some of them very long treatises, and somebody has done the maths, not me, and reckon that we have 5 million of Augustine's words. You're not going to get all of them tonight. Don't worry. But we don't need more by way of biographical details. We need to look instead at his literary and theological masterpiece, The Confessions, written in 13 short books around the year 401. The first nine are autobiographical, essentially. They tell the story of Augustine's life up to his baptism and his mother's death at Ostia as they headed back to Africa. The final four books make clear to us that Augustine's story is essentially everyone's story. An insight into what it means to be human. And that prepares us in the last part of the Confessions to read with Augustine's, if you like, clearer eyes the account of creation and fall in the book of Genesis. So, what's this underlying story in the confessions? Well, the title's in the, well, the clue's in the title. In large part, it's a confession of human sinfulness, but also, at the same time, a confession of divine mercy how God's providence turns our wrong moves to the good. God meets us where we are. Our fate is certainly not decided by the stars, as some thought in the ancient world. Adam and Eve were created with free will. However, as Augustine reveals as he explores and describes, 
our ability to choose freely between good and evil is not enough because we're fatally prone to choose wrongly. Even when we know what we should do, we don't. Our desire for the good isn't strong enough. And bad habits make us vicious. They lock us into patterns of behavior we're too weak to avoid. When push comes to shove, we just don't want enough to do the right thing. Here's how he puts it in Book 8 of Confessions. It was no iron chain imposed by anyone else that fettered me, but the iron of my own will. The enemy had my power of willing in his clutches, and from it had forged a chain to bind me. The truth, says Augustine, is that disordered lust springs from a perverted will. When lust is pandered to, a habit is formed. When habit is not checked, it hardens into compulsion. These were like interlinking rings, forming what I have described as a chain, and my harsh servitude used it to keep me under duress. A new will had begun to emerge in me, the will to worship you, he's talking to God, to worship you disinterestedly and enjoy you, O oh God, our only sure felicity. But it was not yet capable of surmounting that earlier will, strengthened by inveterate custom. And so the two wills fought it out, the old and the new, the one carnal, the other spiritual, and in their struggle, tore my soul apart. It's an incredibly graphic account of his distress, his real anguish. The miracle for Augustine is that God freely acts to release him from the trap. Now the scene is famous, so you may well know it. Sitting in a garden, Augustine hears a child's sing-song voice saying over and over again, pick up and read, tole, lege in the Latin. So Augustine opens his set of St. Paul's letters and finds himself looking at Romans chapter 13 with its call to put on Christ to be baptized. Suddenly, by the gift of God, he finds himself committed to doing what he had previously been unwilling to do. As Augustine later puts it in a prayer to God, you had converted me to yourself. God gives Augustine a new will, a stronger desire for the good, so that his free will is now exercised in choosing the right thing, not the wrong thing. The understanding of how God moves the will is what lies behind the famous prayer that Augustine utters later in Book 10 of the Confessions. Give what you command and command what you will. It's a prayer for self-control and maybe it strikes you as utterly unproblematic. Great, that means you're not a Pelagian. But think about what that prayer implies. It means even after baptism, an inability to fulfill the divine law unaided, without God's help, and makes such help an essential object of prayer. Now, Augustine tells us in a later work on the gift of perseverance that this prayer looks innocent enough to you now that prayer caused a storm at Rome where it was quoted by a certain brother and fellow bishop and violently contradicted by Pelagius. Pelagius did not like that prayer at all. So, who then was this Pelagius? Pelagius.
If you had met him at church in Rome in the early years of the 5th century, you would never have guessed that his name would one day soon be linked to heresy. He was a figure of impeccable respectability with all the right social connections. Augustine describes him as a British solitary or monk and as a servant of God. So he's probably a celibate lay ascetic and not a cenobitic monk, not part of a community of monks. He enjoyed a reputation for holiness, but also for theological learning. And he had pupils, including one called Caelestius, another rather aristocratic ascetic who attached himself to Pelagius around about 390 and popularized his master's teachings. Now you would find these two by the end of the century, by 390 or so, in the circles of a leading Christian senator, Pamachius. You would find that Pelagius was respected by yet another top draw Christian, Paulinus of Nola. You would see him enjoying the patronage of the very best Christian ladies or Roman matrons. He wrote in 413 a open letter, mini treatise, to a young lady named Demetrius, who came from one of the very best Roman, one of the very best Christian families, the Anicii. So when Pelagius first comes to Augustine's notice, it's as someone highly praised by all the right people. Now, sometime between 405 and 410, Pelagius wrote two books, generally well received, for which alarm St. Augustine. One was a commentary on St. Paul's letter to the Romans, the other a treatise called On Nature, defending our possession of free will. So let's now see what Pelagius taught in those two books that so worried St. Augustine. Pelagius thought that God's goodness, God's grace, was manifest first in the gift of a nature blessed with free will. Where's the problem with that? In fact, St. Augustine had defended free will, hadn't he? He reckoned, furthermore, there were individuals in history who, by the use of their free will, lived well. He thought there might be such people in his own day. Where St. Paul at Romans 2.14 speaks of the Gentiles who do by nature what the law requires, Pelagius writes of those who were by nature righteous in the period before the law. But God's grace was also manifest in the gift of the law with the Ten Commandments, making it easier to know right from wrong. Those who sin, Pelagius thinks, imitate Adam. They copy him by their freely chosen sinning. And at Romans 5.12, where St. Paul sees death as the result of that kind of sin, Pelagius sees this not as a reference to physical death, which he thought of as natural but as describing the spiritual death suffered by sinners. The way out was through baptism by the grace of Christ, who has freely forgiven the sins of all, though they are undeserving. So baptism brings unmerited forgiveness, understood as cancelling the merited punishment for personal sins. And for the infant, it may introduce them to a certain intimacy with Christ. Jesus takes on at Calvary the punishment due to sinners. He is the substitute who takes our place. Quote, for we were all condemned to death, to which he handed himself over, though it was not his due, so that he might redeem us with his blood. And that stirs up in us, Pelagius thinks, a profound love for God out of gratitude where St. Paul speaks at Romans 5.5 5 of the love of God poured into our hearts, Pelagius comments, greatness of benefits arouses in one greatness of love, which being perfect does not know what it is to be dismayed and afraid. 
The grateful Christian can thus respond to what God has done for us in Christ with a wholehearted devotion to the Christian life. In the letter to Demetrius, that includes a readiness to strive for moral perfection and to practice a certain asceticism. So what's the problem? Nothing I've set out here rang alarm bells for most lay Christians or clerics. Yet St. Augustine detected a radical fault running through Pelagius' thought. For Pelagius thought our possession of free will meant that we were not damaged by Adam's sin unless we first chose to imitate his bad example. Our humanity is not inherently defective in any way. We don't suffer, for Pelagius, what Augustine will term original sin. That view has huge consequences. First, and most importantly, Augustine was deeply troubled by the idea that even a very few people might never have sinned, might never have imitated Adam's sin, but live righteously simply through the exercise of their own free will and knowledge of right and wrong. Why? Why is that such a problem? Well, because St. Paul very clearly teaches that Christ died for all. If you can just choose the right thing off your own back, what's the need for Christ or Christianity? At best, these point you in the right direction. They remind you of what you need to know. They offer good examples in place of bad. But faith in Christ is no longer essential. Second, for Augustine, if baptism cancels personal sins, but doesn't actually change who we are inside, then there's no real need for infant baptism. Because infants have, let's face it, no personal sins. Augustine was in fact first alerted to the dangers of Pelagius's thought when that pupil Kylestius turned up in Africa promoting this idea about infant baptism. There's a third problem. On this model, we have no need to pray for the strength to do what we can already freely choose to do. And Augustine bridled at that. Doesn't it make a nonsense of the Our Father, our central Christian prayer, the prayer we prayed just a few minutes ago, in which we said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As Augustine glosses that last phrase, help us, lest we are led astray by sinful desire, remove sinful desire from us. So, partly in response to Pelagius, partly out of his own earlier experience of God liberating him from his sinful habits, St. Augustine develops a doctrine of original sin, of every man and woman as being born into this world, damaged by Adam's sin. Possessed of free will, yes, but actually unwilling to turn away from sin, to resist temptation without the grace of God. Even the patriarchs, the holy men of the Old Testament, had to be rescued from this fate by the Saviour's grace, even if that grace was hidden in the Old Testament period. Where Pelagius read St. Paul as telling Christians at Rome, that the love of God poured into our hearts is our love for God. Augustine read St. Paul of speaking of God's love for God acting within us. The divine grace changes us from within. It moves the will to embrace the good. He writes in one of the Antipelagian tracts, it is by a secret, wonderful and ineffable power operating within that God works in men's hearts, not only revelations of the truth, but also good dispositions of the will. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit, whereby there comes into existence within the soul the delight and love of that highest immutable good which is God, even now while they walk by faith and not by sight, so that by virtue of this token, which has been given to them of that free gift, they may burn to cleave to their creator and be fired to go and share in the true light so that they flourish because of him 
to whom they owe their very existence. And rereading St. Paul, partly in reaction to the teachings of Pelagius, Augustine sees our need for God's grace at every stage in the Christian life. So with this sense of fallen humanity's moral perversity comes a development in how Augustine sees the working of God's mercy. At first, Augustine saw God's mercy in calling all people to embrace his forgiveness. He thought our free response to this call through faith was the basis of our election or rejection, our openness to God's further merciful gifts, and so the strengthening of our will to do good, or the contrary hardening of our hearts. He adopts that position in a little work called The 83 Diverse Questions. At another work, Propositions from the Epistle to the Romans, Augustine discusses Romans 9, 11 to 13, where St. Paul talks of why Jacob receives God's blessing and not Esau. Remember the text, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Well, Augustine asks, on what basis could God be said to have loved Jacob and hated Esau before their birth? Not, he thought, through foreknowledge of their good and bad deeds, because these were dependent on God's grace moving the will. So Augustine thinks here, well, God's election depends instead on foreknowledge of future faith, a free response to God's call. But later on, another work, The Diverse Questions to Simplicianus, shows Augustine arriving at a different conclusion. If grace was needed for us to will the good, isn't grace equally needed if we're to respond to God's call with faith? God calls everybody but only some are called in such a way as to gain their consent. Grace precedes and makes for our choice to accept the gift of faith. Faith is all the way through. Grace is all the way through. So we require the grace of God to sustain our love for him so that we use our free will correctly. We must ask for the grace to persevere over the years St. Augustine's reading of St. Paul, especially Romans 7, 24 to 25, underwent an important change. Initially, well, St. Paul writes, you remember, I am a wretched man, or wretch that I am, who will free me from this body of death, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I of myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Initially, Augustine reads the first part as expressing the anguish of a fallen human being who knows what's right by virtue of the revealed law, but is powerless to act before baptism in accordance with his or her knowledge. He then interpreted the second part of the, the, the passage as that liberation through baptism by God's grace, enabling the will to desire the good. But as the Pelagian controversy went on, Augustine came to see that God's grace was necessary even after baptism. So St. Paul, he now understands, is talking about our human condition as Christians. We still need the grace of God to resist the pull of temptation. Well, Augustine set out the theology I've sketched here, and he attacked Pelagius' alternative account of sin and grace across several years in letters, sermons, and treatises. Disciple of Pelagius, Caelestius, had turned up in Rome and North Africa after the sack of Rome in 410, and he had soon enough been condemned by a local synod. Augustine follows up with a treatise and starts to tackle Pelagius himself. First, there's a very courteous exchange of letters, but from about 415, things get nasty. Augustine writes on nature and grace, he teams up with St. Jerem, and Pelagius comes under sharper attack. At first, Pelagius escapes condemnation. He is found not guilty, if you like, by various synods in Palestine and at Rome. And a condemnation by Pope Innocent is revoked initially by his successor, Pope Zosimus. But in 418, the Pope finally condemns 
Pelagius' teachings. He and Calestius were excommunicated. That wasn't wholly the end of the story. Eighteen Italian bishops, led by Julian of Eclanum, tried to push back, and Julian engaged, engaged Augustine in a new round of treatise and counter-treatise over the next decade or so. And towards the end of that exchange come two important works of Augustine on the predestination of the saints and on the gift of perseverance. But the debate had also moved on to focus really more on Augustine's account of sexual lust, in particular with its implications for marriage. And that, as they say, is another story. So if we go back to our original question about what it takes to be good, we can now see Augustine's answer. We rely on the grace of God, who not only gives us knowledge of the truth and free will to choose what we know to be good, but who moves our will from within to desire that good. That grace makes for the initial gift of faith, but is also required for our every good act in the Christian life when we resist temptation and freely choose what is good. We are utterly dependent on God's grace. No wonder then that the medieval theologians termed St. Augustine the doctor of grace. Thank you for giving me the chance this evening to introduce you to the doctor of grace. moves here there are some sheets for you to write your questions and to bring them here to the table before the end of the break and also Luke has asked that you kindly fill in an evaluation form before the end of this break Uh, there's one question relating to the slightly provocative way in which I said that Council Nicaea issued a canon declaring excommunicate those who would refuse communion to, the, to the, those in second marriages. And the question is, um, was this, what, was, was what was being condemned um, refusing communion to widows or widowers who remarried? Now, that's a very intelligent question, because later in, in Western canon law, they interpreted... You see, what the, um, the canon simply says, it condemns those who will not give communion to the re, those in second marriages. And the later Catholic interpretation, when the Catholic Church came to um, insist on the uh, indissolubility of marriage, was that the canon only related to people who had refused communion to those who remarried after when they were widows or widowers. That'd be no problem for us. Um, the canon is not specific, but I don't think it can have intended that restriction because um, discussion of the question about uh, marriage at, at this period never made a distinction between... Uh, for them, the, the question was not, um, is it permissible... Uh, the, the suggestion that... Oh, you, you can you can remarry after widowhood, but not after divorce. That distinction, which we now take for granted, think I've just, was not made. And the debate rather was, the, 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 the rigorous said that um, it's always improper to have a second marriage. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's after divorce or after the death of one spouse. It's always improper uh, because... You know, our Christian life should be an ascent upwards. Marriage is something very earthy. You begin with marriage, that's fine. But later on, to get married again is showing too great enthusiasm for the married life. <laughs> of course, remember, you see, uh, girls were married at puberty by their families. They had no choice. 
The choice, of course, they were younger than husbands normally. Of course, women are stronger. They live longer. So, of course, they, many of them became widows. And this is when the issue came. Is it proper for a widow to remarry? And strict Christians said no. This is showing too much uh, attachment to the um, university. So, um, so that's, that's, a very, that's an intelligent question. But I, as I say, I don't think uh, that, that the fathers of Nicaea were thinking of that distinction. Uh, and now, one question, could you say how the Apostles' Creed was put together? Well, according to the um, canons of the Apostles, the twelve met together, and each of them contributed one line of the Creed. Now, that, of course, is a nice picturesque legend. Uh, the, the Apostles' Creed is, of course, the baptismal creed of the Western Church. Uh, I sometimes use it at Mass, and one can nowadays. Um, it... I don't think we, we it's by the end of the fourth century certainly we, we, we have uh, uh, it's written down and and, and we, we know about it, it it's it's a fourth century creed uh, a bit later than the Nicene Creed in the East they they still were using the Nicene Creed as the baptismal creed which we never have in the West does it answer that question now uh, th three questions I'll hear this a bit why isn't it clear in the New Testament who Jesus is. Well, uh, to me at least, um, well, Jesus is a mysterious figure. There's no doubt about that. Um, he has manifested the Son of God, the representative of God, who exercises divine power in the working of miracles and whose teaching has the authority of the inspired word of God. But if you start pressing about his sort of inner constitution as a person, that, that isn't something which scripture gives us, gives us a direct answer to. This is why theologians have had so many debates over the centuries. How does one explain the Trinity of non-Christian? Oh dear, I remember being in Syria 20 years ago, and a, very, and a nice Muslim who was sympathetic to Christianity said, now oh, please, do tell me, what's meant by the doctrine of the Trinity? That was a challenge. I failed a 